good morning. good morning. Welcome to Parish Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day morning as we gather to worship the living God. Uh, we have a very special privilege this morning uh, as uh, Pastor Mike Finema uh, will be opening the word of truth for us. I said it in the first service. I want to say it again. Uh, we are so grateful to the Lord for you, Mike, and for you, Stephanie, for the way that you have modeled grace for us, uh, for the way that you have shown us how God's grace has abounded to you that has spilled over to all of us. And as a result, we are grateful. Uh, the Bible tells us in the Gospel of John that there is hope in the Gospel. The hope in the gospel comes because of what Jesus tells his disciples, simply saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His, his right, right hand and his holy arm have worked, worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to all the house of Israel. All, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. <laughs> Oh, 
Children, come and gather round, for wisdom you should hear. I'll teach you how to understand and seek the Lord with fear. Restrain your lips from speaking lies, control your foolish tongue. Depart from ill, do good, seek peace, so shall your day. Long taste and see that the Lord is good. Take refuge in his blessing. Fear him, you saints, those who fear. Troubles that afflict the just in number many be, but God delivers from them all the righteous. He sets free your bones. Beloved, hear now from God's holy word as it comes to us from the book of Colossians chapter 1. Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As it is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, that your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. But for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, uh, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, uh, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. seated. If, uh, if you guys don't mind, uh, I'm also going to remain seated while I preach this morning, if that's okay. Um, it's um, it's kind of like Jesus, he would sit down to, to teach with his disciples, so I'm going to take a page from his playbook this morning as well. Um, I, and it's, my wife and I were heading here this morning, uh, I asked Siri how long it had been since uh, November 22, 2020, which is the last time that I was able to preach, and uh, I, I forget the exact number, but she said it was uh, a little over 270 days, uh, so it's been a long time, 
and uh, I'm just thrilled to be able to have the privilege of bringing God's word uh, to God's people this morning. Uh, But before we do that, uh, let's join in prayer. Our most gracious God and our Father in heaven, as we open up your word this morning, I pray that you would open up our hearts uh, to hear from you. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing and honoring in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And it's in Jesus' name alone that we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, As I mentioned, it is uh, both an honor and a privilege to be here with you this morning. Um, As uh, we've gone through a very difficult seven or eight months uh, in our family, uh, one of the things that has been consistent is the love of God's people, and particularly uh, the People here at Parish, uh, you guys have been extraordinarily kind to us. Um, I was asking my wife uh, how I should say thank you this morning, and uh, this is uh, how she described it last night. She said that she has seen the love of Christ through God's people, and it's been such an encouragement to her uh, and to us, and we have seen that particularly here at Parish. So thank you uh, for how you have loved us so well. Um, Over the last couple of months, one of the things that I've been able to do, uh, because I've had a little more time on my hands, is uh, to read. And one of the things that I've enjoyed rereading is one of my favorite books, and that is Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. And I'm going to assume that many people here probably know the storyline. I'm going to give a little bit of it away if you haven't read it, and I'm sorry about that. Um, (laughs) However... Uh, There's an incredibly profound moment uh, near the end of The Return of the King, which is the third book. Uh, Sam and Frodo have been on a journey, and they've been on a journey with this ring in order to destroy it. And in the, the middle of Return of the King, they actually get to the point where they do destroy the ring. Uh, If you haven't read the books, I'm sorry that I gave that away, but that is actually what happens. Um, After that happens, they get to a point where they believe that they are um, in imminent danger and probably are going to die. And at a very, uh, this very powerful moment, uh, eagles come and they rescue them. And Sam and Frodo are so exhausted that they sleep for what seems to be like days. When Sam wakes up, the first person that he sees is a character by the name of Gandalf. Uh, Gandalf is um, one who had journeyed with them, but at some point uh, he had what they thought was died. And Sam, when he wakes up, he sees this person that he thought was dead. And the first thing he says is this, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What has happened to the world? You see, Sam experienced a sort of resurrection with Gandalf. And because of it, he had hope. And he says, is everything sad going to come untrue? I know that this is the case. My family and I, we've gone through our fair share of sadness and grief over the last several months. Uh, My accident, which resulted in this wheelchair, um, has created an avalanche of grief and sadness. Uh, Sometimes it can be overwhelming. My family and I, we need to know that there is such a thing as hope. And thanks be to God, there is. Paul reminds us of that this morning in 1 Corinthians 15. He reminds us that because of the resurrection of Jesus, those who have faith in him will also be resurrected. Because of this, we have hope. The resurrection of Jesus gives us hope. As Paul walks through this problem in the Corinthian church here in 1 Corinthians 15, 
Now, we, as we've walked through this, this whole book, we've seen that the Corinthian church has its fair share of problems. Uh, they have a lot. Uh, like every other church, like Parish Presbyterian Church, like every church that has ever been, uh, Corinth had its problems. Um, I have my problems as well. Uh, a couple of things to note about myself, as, uh, uh, at, well, even as I'm preaching this morning. Um, uh, because of my accident, uh, I have a tendency not to be able to always control my limbs. And so you may see my right leg in particular kind of just stick out this morning. Uh, it happens, it's called a spasm, and there's not much I can do with it. Um, when I get excited or anxious, uh, my knees start to bounce. Um, I can lean forward and hopefully uh, get them under control, and that's fine. Um, sometimes you may see me do a deep bend like this. Um, I was told uh, after one of the services last week that someone saw that and was very concerned that I had dropped something and no one was helping me to pick it up. <laughs> um, it's, actually, uh, it's actually a good stretch for my lower back, and also uh, I spend a lot of time um, sitting down and so it's an opportunity for me to kind of relieve some pressure uh, on my bottom as well. And so, um, and then uh, my hands. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my injury also affected my hands greatly. Uh, I would love to do more gestures, um, but uh, sometimes uh, it's difficult to do that. So, um, I have my problems right now, uh, but there's hope. Uh, the, the church at Corinth had their problems as well. And as I mentioned, Paul addresses them throughout the entire book. Um, one of the biggest problems that they had, he leaves to the end here in uh, chapter 15. One of their biggest problems was that they misunderstood the resurrection. And not just misunderstood it, but their problem was, is that some people, as we see in verse 12, were saying that there actually is no resurrection. Uh, Brian reminded us so eloquently last week, as we looked at the, the first 11 verses here, that the resurrection is kind of a big deal. Uh, actually, it is the biggest deal. Um, it is at the heart of the gospel. And so if you say there's no resurrection, then you're saying that the gospel is not true. Um, so here's what Paul does to address this problem. Uh, first of all, he engages in a thought experiment with the Corinthians. And he asks the question like this. So what if that was the case? What if there actually was no resurrection? What would that look like? And after he gets done with that absurdity, then he comes back to the reality. But Christ has risen. And because he has risen, you also will rise. And because of the resurrection of Jesus... And only because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have hope. So let's see what Paul does here in this passage. Uh, first of all, what he does is he paints a pretty bleak picture with this, uh, this thought experiment. So what would happen if there actually was no resurrection? Well, first things first, he says, if there was no resurrection, Jesus himself would not have been raised. That means Jesus would still be dead. And if that's the case, then Jesus just joins the list of great men throughout history whose grave we can now visit and pay our respects. Uh, in terms of biblical, um, biblical characters, he's just like another David or a Gideon or a Moses or a Joshua or a Nehemiah. Uh, from our perspective, uh, he would just be a, a great uh, historical figure. We could go to the monuments in, in Washington, D.C. and pay tribute to former presidents. Uh, it would be the same with Jesus. Um, we would revere him, but he would be someone who is dead. And if that's the case, Paul goes through a litany then of ramifications if there is no resurrection. He says, if there's no resurrection, then my preaching is futile. And so is faith. If we have a dead Jesus, we don't have good news anymore. Why put your faith and trust in someone who is dead? 
And if that's the case, he says, then we misrepresent God. If we preach that God raised Jesus from the dead and there is no resurrection, we're lying. We're lying about God. And if Jesus was not resurrected, he said, we're still in our sins. If Jesus is still dead, that means that he's not God. And if he's not God, then he can't be our Savior. And if he's not our Savior, then we're still lost and we're in our sin. And he takes it even further. And if that's the case, then those who have died in Christ are still lost. Everyone who has ever died, even those who believe in Jesus, are hopelessly lost. Now, I didn't grow up in the PCA. I grew up in a denomination called the Christian Reformed Church. Um, we did not uh, subscribe to the Westminster uh, Catechism and Confession. Uh, we had the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgian Confession and the Canons of Dort. So I grew up learning the Heidelberg, and uh, I still have a soft spot in my heart for the Heidelberg Catechism, especially question and answer one. And there has not been a funeral that I've been to in the Christian Reformed Church where question and answer one was not uh, read uh, during that funeral, and I'm going to do that now. The question goes like this, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Um, that question and answer has given me great encouragement over the years. But if there is no resurrection, we have no comfort. We have no hope. The only hope that we have, as Paul says, is in this life. And if that's the case, then we are people most to be pitied. This short life, uh, what scripture refers to as just a breath or a vapor, it's all we have. And if that's the case, then poor, pitiful us. Um, it's like the writer of Ecclesiastes said that everything is vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Uh, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. If this is all there is, then maybe we could just make every effort to make this our, our best life now. Uh, if this is our only hope, we might as well make it a good one, right? Um, but Paul reminds us that this isn't it. This isn't the end. He says... That thought experiment that we just went through, that's absurd. The resurrection is real. Christ has been resurrected. We can look back at verses 1 through 11. Paul reminds us of the historical fact of the resurrection. And Paul says, I saw him. <laughs> I saw Jesus. And not only me, but Cephas and the twelve. Five hundred of the brothers saw him at one time. James, all the apostles saw him. Christ is risen. In fact, he's the first fruit of the resurrection. He says, everyone who's of Adam will die, but everyone who is of Christ will live. You know, there's a lot of diseases in this world, uh, ones that have pretty significant death rates, and we can talk about um, percentages and, and death rates, and we've done that a lot over the last uh, several, uh, well, the last couple of years with the pandemic. Um, nothing, though, compares with the death rate of being in Adam, for being a human being. The death rate for being human is a staggering 100%. It's all of us, right? Everyone who is of Adam will die, but everyone who is of Christ will be made alive. Like Jesus, we will literally 
be raised back to life. Christ is our first fruits. He is that promise that we have. Because Christ was first, the rest will follow. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So Paul reminds us this is how it's going to happen. Jesus is going to be first. Everyone else will follow when he comes again. And he paints this incredible picture of what it's going to be like. He says every rule, every authority, every power is going to be destroyed. And that's the way it's supposed to be. It's going to be back to the way that God intended And as Sam said in the beginning, everything sad will come untrue. But here's the problem. Um, Here's the problem that we face today. Uh, The first problem is this. Uh, I need a drink of water. Brian, can you grab that for me? So um, I'll make the same joke I did the first time. This is... uh, the new role of the associate pastor is also uh, also uh, water boy as well. So thank you, Brian. So um, <laughs> he said he didn't mind that I did it the first time, so I could do it again. So um, so here's the problem we face. Um, we say that we believe in the resurrection, and that is our hope, um, but we live as if we don't. We live as if, as if our hope is actually in this life. And how do I know this? Uh, because the vision that we have for our lives are also uh, are often ones of simply personal peace and affluence. That's often how we live. When Stephanie and I, when my wife and I met, we were living in Orlando. I was going to RTS in Orlando. And one of the blessings that we had of being there was often we got to hear from several of the seminary professors who would uh, be, uh, fill the pulpit and they would preach. Uh, one of them was Dr. Richard Pratt. Uh, if you guys uh, have heard Richard Pratt or know of him, uh, he channels the Holy Spirit unlike any other Presbyterian pastor that I know, uh, which is um, uh, just, he's just an incredible uh, individual. And one of the times that he came to preach, um, Stephanie and I both remembered an analogy that he used when he talked about the vision that we have for our lives, and it has stuck with us uh, even over the last 15 years. And he said this, most people do, uh, do these things. They They study hard when they're young so that they can get into the right college or university, that afterwards they can get a good job, uh, buy a house in the suburbs or maybe on some land so that they can then start a family and have the right number of kids, maybe not too many, but also not too few. Um, It's got to be the right number uh, so that we can raise our kids and send them to good schools or tutorials or teach them in our homes so that they can then go on and study hard and then get into the right colleges or universities and and get a good job or buy a house in the suburbs or maybe on some land and they will have the right number of kids but not too many but also not too few and when that happens we can play with our grandkids and hopefully retire at the the right time and maybe play some golf or or do a little traveling and Lord willing, die in our sleep because that wouldn't be so painful. And then when we die and go to heaven, we get to play our part in the heavenly choir and we get our harp that's assigned to us and we'll sit on our cloud and play the harp continuously in this choir forever and ever and ever. And um, Pratt is not the most musical or... um, gifted type in that sense, and he said, I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't sound like heaven to me. (laughs) Uh, That may sound like the other place. Um, And his point was, 
we do this so that our kids can repeat the cycle and then our grandkids and our great grandkids and the cycle repeats itself. And if this is the vision for our life, what it shows is that our hope is not in Christ's resurrection. Our hope is in this life, not the life to come. It shows that the vision that we have for our lives is actually too small. In fact, it's too short. It's not eternal, which God is calling us to this morning. There's a great quote from Thomas Chalmers that says, No matter how large your vision is too small. Um, I am not a Chalmers um, aficionado. I'm not a scholar. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't even know where this quote comes from. Uh, I found it on the internet. I know you can't trust everything you found on the internet. Um, however, I hope this is a reputable source because I found this at, uh, what was it, parishprez.org. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Uh, Hopefully we can trust that side. I think we can. Um, but Chalmers is right. Um, no matter what or how large our vision, uh, no matter what, it's going to be too small. And Paul's calling us to an eternal vision here this morning, a vision that's bigger than this life, because Jesus said that in this life you will have trouble. But he said, take heart, I've overcome the world. Um, so what happens... If this is your vision, and the vision that you have for your life suddenly shatters, when the children that you're raising suddenly become defiant or maybe even turn their backs, um, what happens if you lose your job? What happens if you get that diagnosis? Uh, what happens if the world experiences a pandemic and suddenly the whole world changes? What happens if you're living in the 30s and the 40s, uh, the 1930s and 40s, and Nazi Germany comes and takes over your, uh, your country, and suddenly you're in occupied territory, like what happened with Corey Ten Boom? Uh, there's a book that was given to Stephanie and I uh, over the last several months. Uh, it's a book that is edited by Nancy Guthrie, and it's called Be Still My Soul. And in this book, she gathers together essays and uh, different uh, chapters of books uh, from various writers, and one of them is Corey Ten Boom. And they all talk, excuse me, about suffering. And this is a, an experience that happened to Corey Ten Boom when she was in a concentration camp. She writes, a group of my fellow prisoners had approached me asking me to tell them Bible stories. And in the concentration camp, the guards called the Bible Das Lugenbuch, which means the Book of Lies. Cruel death punishment had been promised for any prisoner who was found possessing a Bible or talking about the Lord. However, I went to my little cot, I found my Bible, and returned to the group of prisoners. Suddenly, I was aware of a figure behind me. One of the prisoners formed the word with her lips, Hide your Bible. It's Loney. I knew Loney well. She was one of the most cruel of all the women guards. However, I knew that I had to obey God, who had guided me so clearly to bring a Bible message to the prisoners that morning. Loney remained motionless behind me while I finished my teaching, and then I said, let's now sing a hymn of praise. I could see the worried, anxious looks on the faces of the prisoners. Before, it had only been me speaking. Now, they too were going to have to use their mouths to sing. But I felt God wanted us to be bold, even in the face of the enemy. So we sang. And when the hymn was finished, I heard a voice behind me. Another one like that one, she said. It was Loni. She had enjoyed the singing and wanted to hear more. The prisoners took heart, and we sang again and again. And afterward, I went to her and spoke to her about the Lord Jesus Christ. Strangely, her behavior began to change until, in a crude sort of way, she became a friend. Corey's hope was not in this life, but 
it was because of the resurrection of Jesus. My vision was shattered on November 28, 2020, when I had a spinal cord injury. My boys, my two oldest, Elliot and Oliver, and two of their friends, uh, Isaac and Schaefer Herrenbrook, wanted to go mountain biking. I joined them and we went to Chickasaw Trace to do trails that we loved and had done many times before. We got to a trail called the Sweet 16. It had one that I had never done. It was an expert trail, but my 10 and 12 year old and Schaefer, who's 13, and Isaac, who's now 18, uh, went down ahead of me. And so I thought, if they're going, let's do it. Um, I remember the first two turns, two switchbacks. Uh, the rest of it is completely blank. I don't remember any of it. Apparently, there was a jump that instead of um, uh, going quickly over it and getting some air, uh, I cautiously tried to just roll over it, and because of that, I flew over my handlebars and landed on my helmet. Um, thank God for the helmet because it probably saved my life, uh, but it resulted in a spinal cord injury. Uh, I laid on the ground there for about 45 minutes while help came. Uh, they immediately airlifted me to uh, Vanderbilt where I had emergency surgery and spent 10 days uh, uh, trying to recover there. And then the next 91 days I spent in a rehab center called the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, trying to regain some strength and function. Uh, thankfully, I'm in a much better place than I was then, but life is hard. And my life now looks drastically different uh, than it did uh, just seven or eight months ago. I used to love mornings. I was a morning person. I would get up early, uh, get a little Bible reading in, and go and do CrossFit. Um, I would come back and wake my wife up with a cup of coffee and uh, get breakfast for my children. Now uh, my wife has to help me get out in and out of bed um, in the evening and in the morning. Uh, my children have to do small tasks for me because I used to be the tallest in my house, and now I can't reach things. So if I want a cup of coffee, I have to ask them to, to get a mug down for me. Um, I miss out on small moments. Man, this happened in the first service, and I was hoping it wouldn't again. Um, but like I said then, um, those who, uh, who um, used to go to, to Spring Hill Prez are probably not surprised at me getting a little emotional. Um, I miss out on small moments like tucking my kids in to bed at night um, because their rooms are on the second floor of our house and, um, and I just can't get there right now. Um, there is just grief upon grief and sadness upon sadness. And the question is, where is my hope right now? Um, is my hope in this life? Um, there is an opportunity for me to be able to walk again. And I do hope that that's the case. My therapists have said I've been making tremendous strides, and that could happen. I can regain much of my function. I can do the, some of the things potentially that I used to do. Um, but my, my hope because of the resurrection of Christ. My hope looks to an eternity where I know that I will walk. In fact, all of us will walk and run and leap for joy. There will be a restoration of our physical bodies. And that's all well and that's all good, but there's gonna be something that's even greater that will happen when Christ comes again. We're gonna be in the presence of God, brothers and sisters. We're going to see Jesus face to face. I'm excited about the opportunity to run and to jump into his arms, but it's just the fact that it's going to be the arms of Jesus. And that's what's going to be more incredible than walking or having physical uh, function restored. It's going to be that we're with Jesus. 
So what does that mean for us now as we walk through this life? It means that we need to be willing to engage in suffering rather than doing whatever we can to avoid it. Um, we need to be grateful for the good gifts of this life, for our families, for our jobs, for the freedoms that we have. But we need to believe that Christ is so much greater. We need to know that this life is not our paradise. We're like the Israelites who are wandering in the desert. This is our wilderness, but we have a promised land that is waiting for us because of the resurrection of Christ. Amen. It's going to be so much greater than we could ever ask or imagine. And I want to end with the vision that John paints for us in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. When God gives him this profound vision of what it will be like because of the resurrection of Christ. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and it was coming out of, down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Yes, Sam, everything sad is going to come untrue. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, and it was bright as crystal, and it was flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And through the middle of the street of the city, also and on every, in either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, which were yielding its fruit in its, each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more, and they will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And John ends his vision with words from Jesus where Jesus tells us, surely I am coming soon. What can we say but amen and come, Lord Jesus? Amen. Uh, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the God only wise. Oh Lord, with the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ before our eyes, oh Lord, we hope in you. You are our life and life eternal. So Lord, forgive us for the way that we look towards the things of this world to give, to give us life rather than you. And so, Lord, we come confessing. We confess, O oh Lord, rebuke us not in your anger, nor discipline us in your wrath. We confess that there is no soundness in our flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in our bones because of our sin. Our iniquities have gone over our head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for us. And we come before you to confess our iniquities. We are sorry for our sin. Do not forsake us, O Lord. Be not far from us, O God. Make haste to help us, O Lord, our salvation. Forgive us for our sins. 
through the work of Christ. Hear this assurance of pardon from Romans chapter 8. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Dear ones, this is the promise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes for in it. The righteousness of God is revealed for, from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Will you stand and sing? <laughs> of the hope of the resurrection, I ask you, dear Christian, what do you believe? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy church, both visible and invisible, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, O triune God, and we join our voices with the angels, the archangels, and the whole company of heaven in this hymn of eternal praise. just heard proclaimed 
and the word preached. Because the resurrection is true, we have hope. Because the resurrection is true, that Jesus Christ on the third day was, was raised again, this table makes sense to us. You see, the only way that we can follow that application point that Mike so eloquently put it, to engage our suffering, is because Jesus has engaged our suffering, our sin, our shame on the cross, and he bore all the wrath that should have been poured out upon me and you upon him. And he died for it. And on the third day, he was raised again. As, as Paul says in Romans, uh, he was raised for our justification. And so that gives us great hope today in the gospel, which is true. You see, it was on the night when our Lord Jesus was betrayed that he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took from the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, the blood that covers you, that makes you whiter than snow. It's for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that as often as we eat of this loaf and drink from this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes. What a hope for those who have put their faith in Christ alone. I pray that's true of you today. If it's not, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that you would lay hold of Christ by faith and repentance. He's paid it all. Come to Jesus. Refrain from coming to this table. And we would love to pray with you if you would like and need prayer. But for all those who are in union with Christ by faith, who love him, and say, Brian, I want to celebrate this supper with great rejoicing and in hope. The table of the Lord is open to you. Come, let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for the resurrection hope that is in Christ and in him alone. And Lord, we come to celebrate, to commune, to be refreshed in your very presence where there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Oh Lord, prepare us now as we make our way to this table to take ordinary mean, means set apart for holy use and prepare us for your presence forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God come to the table of grace.
sisters, the gospel is true. Christ is risen. He is Christ risen is indeed. indeed. Let's pray. The Lord, you have loved us with an everlasting love. Your grace abounds to us through the finished and all-sufficient merit of Jesus Christ, and therefore we now have fellowship with you and with one another in resurrection life. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. We therefore have abounding hope. And for this, we give you all of the thanks and praise and honor. So make us glad, O oh Lord, by the shining of your countenance upon us. In your light, may we clearly see light, giving us a foretaste presently of that fullness of joy which is at your right hand, of those pleasures which are forevermore. And even now, enable us to claim your very great and precious promises in prayer. We pray, Lord, this morning for comfort, consolation, and strength for Stephanie Mizoraki following the loss of her father and for the, her mother and her brother uh, for Mike and Amanda and Grace, Lord, uh, would you be their strength and be their all. Uh, set their hope on eternity because of the resurrection of Christ. We pray, too, for uh, Miles and Chelsea, for Mirandi, for Kim, for Bonnie, for Amy, and for David, as they walk with loved ones through deep adversity and affliction. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the Andina Presbytery that just met in Bogota, Colombia, uh, for Joe and Becky Harrell as they serve the church there, uh, for Pastor John and for uh, the family of Pastor Andres. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon these, our beloved. We also pray uh, for Jim Fitzgerald as he prepares for yet another trip to Egypt and Iraq. Uh, Lord, make uh, all of the resources, uh, all of the provisions that he needs available to him and strengthen him for this good work. We pray for Jamie as he prepares for his floor exam, the last step before ordination. And we ask you, Lord, uh, to the boldly uh, proclaim the word of truth by the power of the Spirit in this, your Son. We pray, too, for our deacon and elder candidates who begin their training tomorrow night. Lord, would you raise up mighty men of valor in the midst of this, your congregation. We pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters all around the world, but particularly this morning, uh, we, we ask you uh, to be uh, present with and empower our brothers and sisters in China, in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Haiti, in Iran, and in Syria. And for uh, the churches now, all throughout Northern Europe, uh, Lord, we pray that you would make uh, the body of Christ, the hands and feet of care uh, to neighbors amidst the horrific flooding in Belgium and the Netherlands and in Germany. Uh, Lord, this morning we're uh, uh, so thankful uh, for Mike and Stephanie Henneman. Pray that you would continue uh, to strengthen their witness, embolden their words, and empower their faith, even as uh, you restore Mike's strength. Bless their family, Lord, we pray. We have seen, we have heard, but we have tasted and we have known your goodness and your kindness, your mercy and your grace. 
your intimate fellowship granted to us by our union with Christ in the resurrection. And so that day by day, moment by moment, we yearn for the fullness of your kingdom's reign. That's why uh, with great and joyful longing, we pray together the kingdom prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christ. of Jesus Christ be encouraged as you receive the Lord's benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Thank you for all visitors and regular attenders. We want to just especially welcome you. And I would direct your attention to the insert in your bulletin. Take a look at that as you go. Uh, I just have a few things to point out to you. One is the women's Bible study this Wednesday night at the Paralini's house. The address is in your insert. That's why you need to look there, right? Uh, at 6.30. So women, make note of that. Secondly, many of you already came to Jamie's 
uh, Sunday school class that's going to go for the next several weeks on American Presbyterianism. If you didn't get to make that, I would strongly uh, encourage you to make uh, preparations to come next week at 10 a.m. for that. Last but not least, we have a toy drive for our nursery. Um, if you have an, a burden to care for children, one way to do that is to donate good and uh, slightly used, maybe, uh, toys for the nursery upstairs or make a donation. Uh, with that in mind, go in the grace and love of Jesus today. Thank you. Thank you. 